I think we have everybody. Good morning. On behalf of the Prince William Board of County Supervisors, welcome to the McCourt Building for today's announcement of the Crisis Receiving Center and Stabilization Services, which will ensure no wrong door access to mental health and substance use care. For those who don't know, I'm Ann Wheeler, Chair at Large of the Board of County Supervisors. Before today's press conference gets underway, I wish to enjoy, uh, introduce today's other speakers in order of the speaking program. After my remarks, we'll hear from Potomac District Supervisor Andrea Bailey, then followed by Delegate Elizabeth Guzman, uh, Executive uh, or Director Lisa Madrone of the Community Services Board, Reverend Dr. Keith Savage, and the Reverend Michael Sessions um, will be closing us out this morning. But before we get started, I did want to uh, recognize some other dignitaries in the, uh, in the audience. We do have many from the Board of Supervisors here. We have Supervisor Kenny Bodie. We have Supervisor Yesley Vega. Supervisor Janine Lawson. As well as I want to recognize Michelle uh, Mayor Michelle Davis Younger from the city of Manassas. Both the cities have been partners in this effort and we are so, so grateful. As noted on today's agenda for the board meeting, the Prince William Board of County Supervisors will author the deed of lease for the establishment of a crisis receiving center. The facility will be just under 79,000 square feet and will be located in the Aquaquan Magisterial District, represented by Supervisor Kenny Bodie. The Crisis Receiving Center, or CRC for short, will increase local service access and capacity, reduce the execution of temporary detaining orders, and will provide more timely access to services to those who are experiencing acute behavioral health care needs. But what makes today's occasion so special is a seamless partnership between local, state, and federal elected officials. Ah. I want to introduce Marlon Debusen, Debusen with Con Congressman Connolly's office, who is here with us today, too. <laughs> I wish to begin by thanking the members of the Prince William Federal Delega Delegation for their tireless support of the creation of the CRC. Special acknowledgement to Congressman Jerry Connolly and his staff for their investment. To our state delegation, Senators Barker, Bell, McPike, Stewart, and Serval, and Delegates Helmer, Guzman, Munden King, Maldonado, Rome, Sewell, Subramanian, and Torian. Thank you for your partnership, endless correspondence with the Commonwealth of Virginia, Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services, and financial support to make today's announcement a reality. To Prince William County staff, I thank each of you for your time and dedication to our unified board vision of investing in the mental health and well-being of our nearly half million residents. Spe special acknowledgement goes to Lisa Madron, Executive Director of the Department of Community Services Board, and Elijah Johnson, who isn't with us here today, our tireless acting county executive. Thank you for your commitment and diligence in seeing this process through. The partnership between county staff and our board has proven to be seamless and has aided in our ability to address the ever-increasing needs for mental health, behavioral health, and the crisis needs in our community. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge each of my colleagues on the Board of County Supervisors. The establishment of the CRC is truly a bipartisan effort and reflects just one of the many ways in which government can work to ensure the betterment of the lives of its residents. <laughs> Once again, I thank you all for being here in attendance today and look forward to a real celebration when we do the ribbon cutting for the Prince William County Crisis Receiving Center. Thank you. With that, I will turn it over to Supervisor Andrea Bailey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna be obedient and follow the program because I'm scared not to. <laughs> So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Delegate Elizabeth Guzman and give deference to her, if that's okay. Oh, it's Shane. I have the old program. I beg your pardon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. So good morning, good morning. to you, and thank you so much for being here this morning. As, um, as Prince William County residents, this is what we do. We come together for a common cause to support each and every one of us. And so I'm thankful this morning that we're gathered here for the Crisis Stabilization Center 
now known as the Crisis Receiving Center, as Lisa Majorin has taught me. I want to um, take you on a journey quickly um, to let you know that this has certainly been a labor of love. When Madam Chair asked me to be the champion, she knew that mental health was deep in my heart to help heal the land in all communities. And so I'm honored to say that in doing so, I was so graced by working with a group of community advocates and sincere, heartfelt advocates that said, yes, this is what we're, we should do. It's been a long time coming. But we did not realize that we we're going to have this thing called COVID come about. And so COVID was not a bad thing. It taught us that out of COVID, something good could happen. Here, hence, the Crisis Stabilization Center. People are suffering coming out of COVID mentally. And so I had the opportunity to work with individuals like Lisa Madron, who's the executive director for the CSB, who wrote all of the plans and the presentations from her heart and absolutely from her skills to make sure that we talk to the community succinctly and directly about what we were going to do. Going to do. Elijah Johnson, who at the helm led us in a very direct path to get it done. But working with an organization who asked me be, to be the champion as well that I've been working with for over 10 years, Voice. And so I'm eternally grateful for all of the ministers and community leaders that came to the table and told me what the needs were and worked in the trenches with me. I want to acknowledge also um, <clears throat> Madam Chair, my friend, who understands my heart and understands this community. In her leadership, we got it all done. I want to acknowledge two people from the, because it was a collaborative effort, both locally, statewide, and federally. I want to acknowledge my friend, Elizabeth Guzman, who took the bill to the General Assembly for me, presented it to, yes. <laughs> presented it to the new appropriations chair while being held up by our former appropriations chair, Dr. Luke E. Torian. They knew what it would, yes, please. <laughs> Dr. Torian's legacy in this community is unparalleled with none other. But both Delegate Torian and Dr. Delegate Guzman and Dr. Torian knew what we needed to do to secure $2.5 million from the General Assembly, and we did. With the other delegation members, Dr. Barker, Senator Bar excuse me, Senator Barker, who has been focused on health initiatives, but specifically mental health. Senator Barker knew how to navigate the waters to make sure that policy and the monies were there to bring back to Prince William County, as well as Senator Jeremy Pike. And I'm eternally grateful for Delegate King, who also was the drum majorette in the halls, assuring that the conversations were being held, as well as Senator Scott Searville. You never refuse Senator Scott Searville. So for our delegation, I'm eternally grateful. Lastly, I want to acknowledge our federal um, support. When we started out, uh, Congressman Connolly, I, I talked to him and he immediately wrote a letter of uh, endorsement to the Appropriations Committee, as well as Congressman Whitman. They both sent press releases to the press, as well as talk to the Appropriations Committee and the new governor. So let's give them a round of applause for the help that they gave us. And then lastly, for the future allocation, I want to thank Senators Kane and Warner who says, we're not done yet. We'll make sure that you get the funding across the nation, but specifically in Virginia and Prince William County for the crisis stabilization centers. So 
I may miss some names, but I want you to know this is a collaborative, bipartisan initiative. When I went to my colleagues, not one of them said no, not one of them. We had two bipartisan votes for the Board of County Supervisors to make this happen. So I'm thankful for you. One of the things that we do also is reach across the aisle to other jurisdictions. And so I want to acknowledge my mayor, Derek Wood, who was the MC for our first initiative when we had our first luncheon to talk about it. I want to acknowledge Mayor Michelle Davis Younger, my friend, thank you. And, thank you. And Mayor Jeanette Rishu, who all came to make this happen. To our public safety community, the higher echelon, I see Chief Newsham is here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your support. Mr. Reyes, the double kings, Tim and his brother, I tell you, they all came to say yes. This is imperative that we do this for Prince William County. And so I'm grateful this morning. This is the initial program while we've been in office that all arms are locked. All arms have the same vision and we've brought it back to the people of this community to initiate. So thank you for all that participate, all that will participate going forward. Thank you for your prayers. Keep hanging in there with us. Thank you. We will now hear from Delegate Elizabeth Guzman. Good morning, I am Delegate Elizabeth Guzman representing the 31st District in the House of Delegates, which includes parts of Prince William and Fauquier County. I am so proud to be part of the leading effort to bring funding for this mental health facility here in Prince William County. I am grateful to Supervisor Bailey for all of her leadership and advocacy on the issue. A special thanks to the County Board of Supervisors for their support to make this vision a reality. The people of Prince William County are all the better for your work. Thank you. <laughs> However, it is important to know that this is not a new issue. We have been dealing with this problem for years. When I was elected in 2017, we were already losing one life a day in Virginia due to the mental health issues. I remember sharing my concerns to the County Board of Supervisors then and alerting them of the amount of people waiting in Prince William County for mental health services. And then, in the last couple of years, the COVID pandemic only exacerbated mental health issues throughout the county. And on top of it, all we, we are losing lives due to the opioid crisis and the proliferation of illegal drugs like fentanyl, killing youth right here in Prince William County. And even though everyone is capable of experiencing a mental health crisis, we know that communities of color and members of the LGBTQ community are often most impacted by lack of resources. Prince William County is an incredibly diverse county with a fast growing population and has been in desperate need of a facility to support people experiencing mental health crisis. And now, after securing 2.5 million in funding this past session, thanks to the hard work of the Prince William County State Delegation, we will finally have a center. At the end of the day, this center will be able to ensure that dedicated mental health care professionals are the ones responding to mental health crisis and not police. And police will be able to focus their resources on other pressing matters related to public safety, 
including gun violence in our communities. This is an all-around win for the Prince William County residents, and I would like to thank each one of the stakeholders here today for, on behalf of my constituents as well. But this center is just not for crisis. The center will be able to people who want non-emergency help for depression, anxiety, and other mental health challenges, but who can currently afford to access that care due to the lack of resources and lack of local providers in the area. Here in Prince William County, we believe that mental health is health care. It is not enough to just, we have to acknowledge and support mental health. We have to put money towards solutions that help with mental crisis and challenges. And this is what you are seeing today, a collective effort. I am so extremely proud to be part of the effort that we just don't state on our beliefs and values, but we also lift and act on tackling this issue. Thank you so much for those who have contributed to this moment. Thank you. Next up, we'll hear from Lisa Madrin, our Director of our Community Services. Good morning. I am so thankful and grateful to be here. And I really want to thank our champion, Supervisor Bailey, Chair Wheeler, and all the board of our county that provided the ongoing funding that we have to be able to initiate the first phase of our crisis receiving center. Certainly Delegate Guzman for championing this through the General Assembly. And all of the advocates, Voice, NAMI, Trillium, and the constituents that spoke up about the need in our community we were able to raise 11.9 million of one-time funding toward this effort. And a special thank you to the Potomac Health Foundation that provided us two million in that, of that one-time money. And we are able to co-locate the Crisis Receiving Center with some of our community services programs that will help bridge the service needs for individuals experiencing crisis and being able to stay out of crisis, hopefully. Our trauma program that was funded this past session by the board will be co-located there, as well as our assertive community treatment program, our peer program, and some youth services programs. We've only just begun. This is the first step to allow a part of our full adult program, and we still need ongoing funding for youth and the other adult. But it is a wonderful first step. So thank you for your advocacy and for recognizing how vital it is to serve those in crisis appropriately and help them get the treatment. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from the Reverend Dr. Keith Savage. Good morning, everyone. I'm Reverend Dr. Keith Savage. I'm the senior servant of First Baptist Church, and I'm also the co-chair of Voice. I'm going to speak in giving thank you to so many who have made this come to fruition as uh, Ms. Madron said this is the first phase of so many important things that we need to do. You will hear more about this from Reverend Michael Sessoms. When Voice helped to start uh, this campaign 16 months ago with all of these allies that you've heard so much about, we all had a vision. And the vision was to change the status quo around how we minister to, treat, acknowledge, and help our neighbors who are pre current and post-crisis around mental illness and addiction. I believe we are on our way to making sure that this vision comes into fruition. For too long, too many people who are suffering had ended up in jail or warehoused in our hospital emergency rooms simply because there were no other treatable options for them. And this is not only tragic, it was totally unavoidable. 
And today wouldn't have been possible without the leadership from a plethora of people and organizations who supported and continue to help lead this work and some deeply felt thank yous are in order. I'm gonna start with Supervisor Andre Bailey for being our champion in this cause from the very beginning. You have been most critical to why we are here right now and voice remains grateful to you, thank you. We thank the chair of the Princeton County Board of Supervisors, Chair Ann Wheeler. We thank you for your steadfast support and your leadership. You have been incredibly important in this celebration. And Voice is always thankful for your tremendous support and the work you do as the chair of this board. Thank you so much. We also need to thank this entire Prince William County Board of Supervisors because as you heard, this is a collective effort and you decided to put skin in the game because it's only until you put your own dollars in that you realize the importance. And so it took this entire board and we are grateful for the entire work of the entire Prince William County Board of Supervisors. We also want to thank Delegate Elizabeth Guzman and Delegate Luke Torian because you, gave, you made sure you were a champion for that money that put us over the top that we might be able to bring this to fruition, not just for the residents of Prince William County, but for all citizens who are in this region, in this area, that they might access the needs so desperately needed to make this facility a fruition. So thank you so much, and Delegate Tory. We thank the incredible Prince William County staff, the leadership, including the acting County Executive Eliza Johnson, and of course, County Executive, uh, for Executive Director Lisa Majorin, for the Community Services Board, for the entire work that you continue to do, uh, as you heard from Supervisor Bailey, being the brainchild of how best to bring this crisis now model to fruition, and so we're so grateful for that. We're grateful for our federal uh, delegates, like Congressman Whitman, and also uh, for all of the Congressman Conley and others who have helped make this uh, a reality. We thank Senator, State Senator George Barker, State Senator Jeremy McPike and the entire Prince William County State Delegation, State Senator Adam Eben. We thank uh, someone who's near and dear to my heart, the Mayor of Manassas, because she's also a member of my congregation, but also Mayor Michelle Davis Younger for also being a part of this, and Manassas Park Mayor uh, Jeanette Rochelle. We thank Police Prince William County Police Chief uh, Peter Newsham, Manassas Police Chief Doug Keene. Dana Shrad and the Virginia Association of Chiefs of Police, the Prince William County Chapter of NOMNI, for those who don't know, National Alliance on Mental Illness. We thank Dr. Margie Belfour and Morgan Matthews from Connections Health in Arizona. And of course, we thank the entire VOICE, if you will, organization, VOICE Virginians Organized for Interfaith Community Engagement. This has been part of the vision that we have wanted to see come to fruition for so long, and we are grateful for each and every person who has made this the first step of a much larger vision that we will be the model, not just in the Commonwealth, but in this country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Savage. Next, we'll hear from Reverend Dr. Michael Sessions. Good morning. Let me be clear, I'm not Reverend Doctor yet. I got one more year to go. All right, I just want to make sure that that was clear. Um, today is a great day in the county. As you know, I am Michael Sessoms. I'm senior pastor of the Little Union Baptist Church in Dumfries, Virginia, and a member of Voice Leadership Strategy Team and the Prince William County Voice Leader. After countless meetings and strategy sessions and rallies and negotiations, testimony, email blasts, uh, press uh, uh, events, and a million of other things that went into this campaign, I am thrilled that the Prince William County Crisis Receiving Center is on its way to becoming a reality. With the opening of the Crisis Receiving Center, we are beginning a new dawn uh, in Prince William County one where we can uh, begin to create a more humane and effective mental health system. In this county, 
we are turning away from the era of mass incarceration. Not only that, but also oppression and turning to a brighter future. Make no mistake, when the CRC is up and running, it will save many lives in our county. And that is a true blessing. Today marks not the end of this work together, but the beginning. Voice together with everyone here is determined to make sure that this is the best CRC in the state and a model for our country. We will continue to fight for full funding and all the needed resources for the CRC to expand. Today helps give meaning to my own struggles. Rooted in my time serving in, a, in Iraq, and many of you have heard my story, I could have been a victim, but thank God I had the resources to get the help that I needed. It reminds me of a biblical story. This young man who was, matter of fact, he was so demonized until he didn't have a name. All they knew that he was crazy or he had mental issues. Matter of fact, he was family, stayed away from him, they were afraid of him, and he lived in the graveyard. And not only that, but he, I guess, hated himself to the point that he would cut himself. But the greatest therapist of all, my Lord and Savior, came to this man, talked with him, and he was relieved of his mental issue. And then after he was relieved and people were astonished, he wanted to go and live with Jesus. Jesus said, no, go back home. Tell your family, tell your friends, all the good things that have happened to you. In other words, tell folk that even though you had a mental uh, uh, issue, you don't have to be stigmatized. But go ahead and let people know that there is help. Thank you so very much. So that will conclude our press conference for today. I want to thank everyone who came out. You know, as I look around the room, I realize how many people worked for this today. You know, and I'll say, you know, some, sometimes people ask us as elected officials, you know, why do you do this? And days like today is why we do this. When people can come together, work for something positive, and do something good, this is why we do this. So thank you all for coming out today, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. A uh, question? Yes. I'm hoping someone can answer what type of services will be offered and express the need for something like this in Simpson County. I will turn that over to Ms. Madron. <laughs> we are in the process of, uh, of issuing an RFP to a Crisis Now vendor to operate the Crisis Receiving Center that will have walk-in urgent behavioral crisis care. So someone can walk in if they're in crisis, they can be dropped off by someone. If they need to stay up to 23 hours for observation, they will have crisis intervention services. And if they need longer than that, they will have crisis stabilization where they can stay overnight. It usually averages three to four nights um, that they can stay at the center and then a warm handoff if further community treatment is needed. I have a question for Chair Wheeler. Chair Wheeler, what's your response to uh, residents who have formed a bipartisan recall effort that they say you failed to disclose tech stocks and now in the wake of a uh, staff member who they say stands to benefit in the land use process? What's your response to that bipartisan effort? You know, I, I appreciate you're here today with your blog and, and what you're writing about. Um, I do want to say this day isn't about me. You're welcome to write whatever you want. Today we are here to celebrate coming together as a community. Question. Thank you for pointing that out, yes. Uh, 
I will let uh, Ms. Maiden address that. 988 is a national effort to create an easy call line nationally for a hotline. We are also in the process as a state to create regional crisis call centers that the 988 national line will feed into. The hope is that the regional centers, and we have one now that serves Region 2, which is this region, will eventually evolve into not only taking the hotline calls, but dispatching mobile crisis. We've, we're already piloting some of that with our communications 911 center here, and our co-responder program is being dispatched um, in certain circumstances that are connected to the Marcus Alert, so the levels that need mobile crisis versus the levels that can be um, addressed by a hotline. So there is recognition that capacity could greatly increase. Even over the weekend when 988 came out, um, Regionally, we saw a 99% increase in the calls. The majority of those calls were to find out more information. That Think now, though, as a national hotline with it being phased in to becoming more specific to the locality. Ms. Palermo. If I forget some of your question, please remind me. Um, so the vision is to have 16 adult crisis beds and 23-hour recliners for observations. The first phase is eight, eight and eight, eight crisis, 23 hours, and eight crisis CSU beds. And all of that is based on ongoing funding. Right now, the county has been the only one to provide ongoing funding. If the state, if Congress provides additional ongoing funding, we will gladly expand to the full vision. The full vision would be 16 and 16 for adults, and eight 23-hour beds, and, tw and eight CSU beds for youth, and youth being adolescents. In in terms of what's housed there, um, the five-year plan has provided more services for the community through community services. I mentioned the trauma program that we were really excited about to provide short-term trauma treatment intervention that we think would be very helpful. That program is slated to be located at um, the, the new site as well as some other community services programs that are related, intense programs, peer services, youth services programs. We will be moving some out of Ferlazzo or Sudley North to give us space for additional, perhaps, positions in the five-year plan. We will also start new programs like the trauma program there that has not been housed before in Sudley or Ferlazzo. In terms of opening, I would love to say this could have opened in May, but the facility is, well, it was where the COVID uh, um, vaccinations were given. So some of you may see it's very warehouse kind of space. So it definitely needs to be retrofitted. And the RFP, the vendor that, we will, that will operate the CRC will be integral for setting up the crisis receiving center. We will need to go through reviews and um, approvals for zoning and plans, and that takes county time. So giving a very, um, 
hopeful estimate, it could be anywhere between 18 to 24 months. But if I have anything to say about it, and with a lot of prayers, we're hoping it would be under that, if at all possible. We'll have to get back to you on that. And I don't know if it goes up to a million dollars a year. That doesn't sound quite right to me, but we can check into that and get you an answer from staff after that. So, press question. With that, uh, I know we have all, a bunch of us have an 11 o'clock meeting, so that will end our press conference today. Thank you all for coming out.